Hi there, this is Professor Nugent. I want to take some time to look at the cases that we've so far completed in our course. Now, the first case I asked you to look at was Cisco. And this is an example of a company who sort of had some trouble, their strategy wasn't working well, and they made some mistakes. And it was a good case to start off to look at a company that everybody knows, Cisco, um, a really breakout company from the 90s and early 2000s that fantastic growth rates and profitability, but, you know, things seem to go off track with them. So uh, what happened? Let's, let's think, let's look at the questions here. Um, one, from your, from what you've previously heard about Cisco, what features made this firm widely successful over the past two decade, decades? Uh, what does it sell? How does Cisco manage its growth? Uh, what, was the, what was unusual about its R&D strategy? How does the firm manufacture its products? Okay, so a lot of these this questions could be answered from the very generous amount of articles I listed you know, below to kind of help you with uh, the case and also their website gives you a good overview of, of their products the, you know uh, from application networking services uh, to networking software networking hardware equipment I mean we all think of Cisco and we think router switcher switches um, a long time ago I, I worked for a company that made networking equipment um, that was put out of business by Cisco uh, SMC Networks, uh, although the brand name may be around somewhere. I haven't seen it lately, but I was in the industry for a while, so I'm familiar with uh, these products. And Cisco was just really a tough competitor. I mean, when they moved into the area, um, if the company was a very strong competitor against Cisco, Cisco simply purchased them, you know, and got them out of the way. So it was really a juggernaut that just uh, rolled into the whole um networking and communications area uh, with a vast host of products and services, uh, mostly products. So the website would, does a good job of outlining what they currently um, sell and what they're about. Now, so Cisco is this big, gigantic tech company that returned a fabulous amount of wealth to investors. But at a certain point, it started to have growing pains. And a lot of this started in the collapse of their stock price around 2000, 2001. Now, so the company got very large and their stock price was extremely overvalued. And they were using that stock price to uh, purchase other companies. And that helped fuel their annual growth, uh, helped fuel their innovation. So if they found another company that was innovative, they would buy them and, and adapt their technology. So their R&D... Uh, strategy they didn't have too much they didn't spend too much emphasis or time or self homegrown self promotion of research development they went out and purchased their research development by buying other companies and when your stock was so uh, powerful so valuable they're able to pay for most of these companies and stock deals and that's how they were generally able to fuel their innovation momentum from all these acquisitions they really didn't do a great job nurture, nurturing the development of the internal uh, innovations inside the company uh, and a lot of these companies once they were purchased they missed opportunities to really harness harness all of the innovative products and people at these companies after they were purchased. Uh, one of the things I feel is they just went on a purchasing spree that was just too quick to really digest all the purchases they've been making. Now, when their stock sort of collapsed through the uh, tech bubble, they, they had slowed down their acquisitions tremendously. Uh, and they weren't as innovative and they didn't grow as fast as they used to, which frustrated a lot of um, investors. Now, and they made some mistakes. They a uh, big mistake that they made is they moved into, uh, they spent, you know, a huge amount of money buying this flip company. Um, so, so in the article, it actually points out exactly how much they paid. I believe it was um, five hundred ninety million dollars. You know, and the company. Um, you know, the flip was a way to connect with consumer, and these were the little video recording devices uh, that was out of their strategic area of expertise, which was networking. 
and you know company products and they were going first time to the consumer and they purchased this flip company you may have seen these flips uh in the past um i had one at school for a while they were pretty handy uh pretty nifty but not a good strategic move because it was putting them in an area that they were not <clears throat> competent in which was selling products directly to individual consumers now and it was also very short-sighted because once um telephone um cell phones came out with video capabilities you know the new iphone 4 is an incredible video camera it really didn't make it make the flip that valuable and you know today the flip has quietly gone away if you see it on the company's website they don't talk about the flip mention it i don't think it's even for sale anymore so this was a big blunder by cisco to, to invest in this flip product now um it wasn't part of their core business or their strat their core strategic uh advantage so these are things that sort of um put Cisco on the ropes. Now, they've, they have since realized um, that their product lines are in a more mature stage, that the growth rate isn't as um, big as it used to be, but they've looked at their strategic uh, plans for the future, and they are now, again, refocused on um, their core competencies, making uh, networking uh, uh, products and solutions and they've also uh, started to keenly look at and switch over to and this is what this last article was about um, the cloud so the so Cisco is looking to move uh, into take advantage of this new movement of the cloud so Cisco is going to update its UCS products and they have a new cloud strategy so if you're wondering what the cloud is the cloud is where all companies are going to storage store um, all their data in an off-site facility, which, you know, in, they're hoping for consumers not to have hard drives but store all of their um, personal files and storage in a cloud environment. An example of this would be the Dropbox. So the Dropbox is a program that's cloud-oriented here. And the, the, so the Dropbox... Um, this is my Dropbox. I'm going to sign out. So the Dropbox is an area where you can sign up for free and you could store your files online and access them at any computer, including your iPhones uh, and tablets and iPads and things like that. So this is where the uh, future is in um, for a lot of networking routers and switches equipment because companies are going to need uh, to connect to the cloud and they want to connect with the fastest means possible so they can access large volumes of their data over the cloud as quickly as possible and for individuals and consumers you want us the cloud want you want the cloud to act as quick or as fast as your hard drive and what's convenient for us is now that we have individuals have so many devices cell phone um, iPad or tablet PC, laptop, you want to be able to have your file centralized so whatever you're looking for is at your fingertips no matter where you are, whether you're at your work PC, your home PC, your you know, uh, laptop on vacation. So these are all things that Cisco's aware of and they're slowly moving back to their core competency, focusing on their strategies, and also developing a better research development internal um, abilities so these are things that the articles below contained most of what i'm talking about some of them some students found some of these answers by going out on the internet into the library research of articles or looking for articles online and or even cisco's website themselves and bringing in some additional information that wasn't mentioned in the articles or some more updated information uh, to really balance out their their case study on Cisco. So again, this is a good way to start our first case study. The questions weren't that involved, and we're, we're talking a very uh, company everybody realizes, and just getting an idea of how strategy can, you know, sometimes go in the wrong direction for a company, and they have to think about what, what did we do in the past that was successful, and what wasn't successful, and what environment are we today, and how can we move forward? So that was the basics of the Cisco case. All right, moving on. The next case we talked about was Netflix. Now, Netflix had a huge problem. Um, if we look at the stock price of Netflix, at one point the stock was about $300 and then went down to under 100. Right now it's close to an all-time low of around you know, $70. 
So what happened to Cisco here? I'm sorry. What happened to Netflix? What could possibly happen in their strategy, their strategic management that caused such a drop off in the stock price? Now, I would normally say that, oh, this must be um, a financial issue. But initially, it was really a strategic shift. Netflix um, had decided to uh, change their pricing of their product. Uh, and what they decided was instead of having one price, <clears throat> I forgot exactly what that price was, you could get <clears throat> both online streaming and discs directly mailed to your door for one particular price. So they had uh, one service that both streaming and direct to mail DVDs for a low price. <clears throat> uh, say it was $9.99. Then they decided to decouple and break the services into two. And they said, okay, now as a consumer, um, you would have to pay a higher price if you want both mail and online streaming, almost do you know, uh, doubling the price. So many subscribers, including myself, when I heard this news, I was furious. Um, you're, you're increasing the price at such a huge percentage. Uh, I'm not getting anything new for this. Uh, and now suddenly I'm deciding that you know, $15, $16 a month is too much for a net subscription. Net like subscription. So they uh, had a price point that worked for most people uh, and their, I could deal with their poor, poor level of content on their streaming side because I could um, mail order any, any supplemental DVDs I wanted to watch that was not included in the streaming. So it was a pretty good solution. When they raised the price so dramatically, almost trying to encourage, discourage people from doing the mail, in, mail order solution in favor of the streaming, and trying to shift the audience of the people, the, their consumers to one side to the other, it really left a bad taste with consumers. And many of them dropped the service rather quickly. I think they lost like a million customers um, in a short period of time. And that's why investors got really scared uh, and dumped the stock dramatically based on this bad strategic decision. At the same time, Netflix decides to... Um, do an expensive expansion into um, new markets, you know, spending a huge amount of money to, to uh, move uh, Netflix into new markets, uh, untested, unproven, unprofitable markets at this point. So they had two major business areas. They had the online streaming and the mail order business. Uh, the mail order, mail order business is what started the company. We all know how this works. You go online, pick out a DVD, they mail it to you. When you're done watching it, you mail it back to them. No late fees ever. And that worked really well. Now, it was the company was doing very well. I mean, a $300 stock price was very encouraging for them. And they decided to spend a huge amount of money to move other business uh, to other international markets. Uh, now, this would have been fine, except their domestic market, when they decided to um, increase their price dramatically, they lost a lot of subscribers, and their stock plunged. Uh, in some, one day, 35% uh, the stock plunged. So you could see that uh, they made a big mistake, you know, and the shareholders were fearful of um, what was going on. Now... Netflix did not know exactly how to handle this initially. Um, so uh, Red Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, who might also make an interesting character to do your report on, um, I'm sorry, to, to talk about during the case work, because uh, he's sort of the person who is uh, making all the decisions at Netflix. He's really solidly in charge of what's happening. Now, he drafted a letter, which I included, to, to talk to customers about the decision to raise, and here it says they raised the price 60% price hike uh, that re resulted in almost a million subscribers um, dropping the service based on this you know, incredible increase uh, in, in, in price for their service. So he, he drafted a letter saying, you know, it was a mistake and he was going to create two services. Uh, one was going to be Netflix, which would be the streaming, and one would be a mail order service. And then later, when customers complained, I don't want two services, now I have to have two uh, um, 
two lists of movies I want, two different websites to go to. So his second trying to repair the damage from his first mistake didn't work either. And he really, he really messed up. I mean, what I would have done with Netflix is I would have went back to Scribe and say, listen, okay, our, our, our pricing price hike was a mistake. Obviously, um, the benefits don't outweigh the costs, and we're going to revert back to our previous pricing um, levels. I mean, that is what I think the customers really wanted them to do, and they kept trying to defend their position, create a second company, and then retract the second company. So a lot of strategic problems, uh, all in the midst of them trying to uh, expand into uh, Central and South America, uh, you know, and go more international with their business. And now because of all the subscriber losses, they started to take on some red ink and started to lose money based on the twin uh, factors of the expense of expanding into new markets and the, and, and, and the loss of... 800 to a million subscribers based on the price increase really started to take a toll on the financial aspect of um, Redbox as well. So strategy clearly needed to be changed. And one thing they're trying to do is uh, provide original content, sort of like Homebox, and have their own original shows to give uh, the Netflix subscription more value, more benefits, because now it's not only about renting uh, DVDs of movies or TV show series, but now you can also get exclusive new content as part of their new strategy. So uh, very interesting, uh, very dynamic, very interesting look at a company strategically making some wrong moves as well. Um, expanding too quickly, uh, abruptly changing their price strategy without getting a uh, adequate feedback about how subscribers would feel about it um, you know moving in to break the company into two separate divisions for consumers to utilize only getting backlash afterwards and reverting them back to one company so you could see that um, a lot of what Red Hastings did here was not good um, and his strategy his strategic thinking he messed up quite a number of times it seems like to me he has too much power in this company and he doesn't have a good board or a good other vice presidents to kind of bounce these ideas off of and really think about and have some constructive uh, criticism uh, about the benefits and drawbacks of some of his strategic planning and thinking so this was another great case looking at a company that had, had really fallen from a very top perch of you know, uh, stock price and admiration that people had for this company, you know, just um, by making a couple, you know, small strategic changes. Now, I'm sorry, not small, big strategic changes. Now, if you look at a company like Redbox, now there's a company that put a price increase the right way. So Redbox is a, is a competitor. They, uh, let me see if I can get their website up. Okay, so Redbox is a competitor, and we all know Redbox. So you, they're at 7-Eleven, CVS's, Stop and Shop, and uh, renting is easy. You know, find a movie, uh, and then pick the, reserve them, pick them up, or go directly to Redbox, pick your movie out in a touch a touch screen, swipe your credit card, and then the movie comes right out, bring it back the next day. And for many years, it was just a dollar a day. Now, they instituted a price increase to $1.20. Now, they had almost no backlash or no loss of sales from customers because one, it's not a subscription. Customers did, were not forced into paying the price increase. Two, it's 20 cents. That's not really, uh, when people look at a 20 cent increase, no one's going to be concerned about it. Uh, and they didn't raise the price of their Blu-ray discs, uh, and they also moved into renting games as well. So Redbox was an example of a company that had the correct strategy in pricing their product and putting a 20% price increase in the product without customers even blinking an eye. In fact, their sales went up. So Redbox as an alternative to Netflix put additional pressure on Netflix as well because their strategic decisions were, um, okay, not everybody wants to stream their content and, and not everybody wants to have a subscription to the service because how many subscriptions are we supposed to pay? I'm sick of monthly bills. The Red, you know, Redbox is just something, okay, I, I want to rent a movie. Maybe I only like to watch a movie. When I had Netflix, maybe I rented two movies for them a month and I'm paying, you know, say at the time, $10 a month. I found, um, like many consumers, the red box would be cheaper and a little bit more convenient because uh, I don't mind walking around the corner to the red box location. Okay, 
So let's talk about our third case, McDonald's. Now here's a case that is a success story. Finally, a success story. Now McDonald's is uh, something we can all relate to. And so the first question I ask is, how many of you have eaten at McDonald's recently? Uh, and have you seen signs of the food improving? Quality and amenities. Um, and what are some features of the, of the fast food experience that has improved? Uh, and maybe cause you to spend more money at McDonald's. And, and I have to say that as a former employee of McDonald's, that's right. Um, don't get too excited. I was 16 at the time. I learned a great deal about McDonald's. And I, and I do see that McDonald's had a good quality of food uh, when I worked for them. And then over the years, especially in the 90s, the food just deteriorated uh, to a point where they lost their strategic focus. Their strategic focus at one point shifted from the food they were serving in their restaurants to, oh, let me invest in a pizza company, in a Mexican restaurant, and let me uh, buy Boston Market and invest in that. So they were looking at diversifying their holdings to get a cha different chains of restaurants rather than focusing on McDonald's itself. Now, uh, if, we, if we look at the McDonald's website, uh, we could see that uh, they now, some new products they now have, oatmeal, and here's a blueberry banana nut oatmeal, that actually looks good, um, real fr fruit smoothies, um, if we look at their, um, I guess their full menu here, they now have, um, they've always had burgers and sandwiches and chicken, they actually enhance their, their breakfasts, their, their salads, uh, their sides, so it's been a, a pretty, um, I think, comprehensive look at adjusting their menu. Okay, so they had some professional chefs come in and redesign specifically the, you know, the chicken sandwich, the bun that came in, the, the, uh, how, you know, how it was presented, the box it was in. They developed um, these wraps. So this was a big seller for them, their Chipotle barbecue snack wrap, their Big Mac snack, snack wrap, their chicken snack wrap, their breakfast burrito. So a whole new line of wraps, which was a way of them uh, making an item that's more edible on the go. So if you buy these in the drive-through, they're very, e very easy to eat while you drive. You know, they developed um, chicken selects uh, and a whole host of, uh, you know, they enhanced their chicken nuggets to be only white meat. They dropped the dark meat nuggets. Uh, you know, they, they enhanced their salads greatly. At a time, one time McDonald's was selling their salads in the cup. And it was just a cup you would think you would drink a soda out of, a soda out of, and they put the salad inside the cup. That did not work at all. It was a disaster. So they had, again, brought in professional chefs who came in and redesigned and put in a full line of um, salads, which are actually quite good now. And, have, uh, and breakfast, they enhanced the breakfast by adding a couple more healthier uh, snacks. Say the uh, oatmeal is one, the parfait. Uh, fruit and walnuts, uh, you know, in addition to their biggest success in their breakfast line over the last, uh, and their first successful product since the chicken nuggets in 1983 was their Mc, uh, McGriddle sandwiches, which was sort of like a pancake wrapped around uh, sausage and egg. Um, okay, so that's just an idea. A big area also, a huge area for them is when they decide the focus on the McCafe and they said you know Starbucks is making all this money and we're losing out in a great segment here and they went in and they redesigned all the McDonald's to have a cafe element uh, put in so they could make premium roast coffees cappuccinos um, mochas frappe you know um, well that's a Starbucks term uh, I can't say that uh, real fruit smoothies um, you know uh, frappe you know, iced coffees, you know, you name it, McDonald's is trying to move it into that beverage area. And this is a significant source of growth for them, you know. Okay. Just looking down here. And they got, I guess, a couple of new desserts. So that, you know, so they're definitely the food, not only is the quality of their food, but their innovative, uh, the innovation of their product lines and new product offerings have definitely have increased at McDonald's. So I think we all can agree on that. So McDonald's got into its groove by really uh, focusing on its food. Uh, and its competitive advantage at McDonald's is very tasty food. And they were able to refocus, drop the food lines or the products that were not doing well, reinvent the products that could do better, such as the chicken sandwich. And they really stepped up um, 
their offerings. And that has shown. They, and McDonald's has prospered. Their sales have gone up year over year for the past seven years. Their profits, uh, they've been doing quite well. The, their uh, sales and their the year over year sales in their stores have have increased. So they've done very well. Their stock price has been uh, tremendous. I mean, if we look at um, McDonald's stock price, uh, let's look at their chart. And let's, let's do it for a um, five-year period of time. You could see that, you know, uh, in around uh, 2008, their stock was about $50 a share. And this is when they started implementing a lot of these changes. And they have since doubled, at one point, doubled their stock to $100. So this, their strategic uh, decisions have really been profitable for the company. Um, Okay, so one of the things that McDonald's did was um, instead of building new, more restaurants, which they sort of saturated the market with these McDonald's restaurants, they decided to open them 24 hours. And, you, and you'll notice that, you know, in the Stony Brook area, 347 and also um, the McDonald's on Middle Country Road and Center Reach are both 24-hour McDonald's, which a lot of McDonald's have moved to a 24-hour um, policy. And this has helped fuel additional sales because McDonald's realized that the um, people have different schedules now. More people work 3 to 11, more people work overnight, uh, more people keep different hours. So they saw an advantage to, being, to staying open. In most cases, it was only an extra four hours from uh, 1 to 5 or maybe 12 to uh, five, five extra hours, has really been able to make the McDonald's and the individual franchises to increase their sales, to capture these late night sales. And they, they also, you know, expanded into uh, more into international markets and developed um, a strategy of focusing on what would work better in international mar markets and a differentiation strategy for local markets in this article about how they actually deliver in some markets, but they don't do it in our market. Um, so we look through the, uh, the articles that I kind of put out, you know, uh, they do have, you know, uh, this is a nice little graphic about the, di the they debuted the different foods that they, uh, reinvented the chicken sandwich in 2005, the snack wraps in 2006, breakfast burrito <clears throat> 2007, Southern style chicken sandwiches in 2008, then 2009, things really got going with their, uh, cappuccinos and mochas, as well as a premium Angus beef roast uh, beef burgers, uh, fruit smoothies uh, and caramel frappes and oatmeal in 2010. You know, added you know um, apples to the kid meals. So this is definitely they're definitely increasing and enhancing their product line. Um, as far as they're also made some strategic decisions to focus on Asia try to compete with, I mean, KFC is very much, and one student who's actually uh, from China was telling me that in her local town, she was writing in her paper that there were 10 KFCs, but no McDonald's. So McDonald's had a lot of ground to cover uh, around the world and opening up their, their franchises uh, and expanding internationally. Domestically, there's not much room to expand uh, except for going 24 hours, but internationally, McDonald's, here's someone, you know, McDonald's delivering international. They've been trying to do uh, what they can to refocus on international markets and offer a lo more local menu selection and more local services. Um, okay, so these articles um, just talk about, I just made a collection of different articles talking about, you know, how they're trying to compete against Starbucks and um, McDonald's being open 24 hours. So they made a lot of strategic moves to enhance the company over the past I'd say, you know, 10 years, they started uh, 10 years where the stock had really suffered for a long time. And I think you could see that McDonald's today is a much healthier corporation because of it. Um, the, an interesting aspect, at one point, McDonald's had a large investment in Chipotle Mexican Grill, which they, um, I'm not sure exactly what happened with that, but they were heavily invested in that company. And that company has, has, um, that was one of the, I think they de-invested themselves of them somewhat when they went public and that company has done very well. So 
just sort of as a side, a side note. Uh, so I think I hope you found this article really interesting to look at. Um, a good example of a company making the right strategic moves and moving into uh, focusing on their core strengths, their food, uh, and, the, and the management of their restaurants, the McDonald's brand restaurants, and uh, recognizing the opportunities overseas. Uh, so it's quite an interesting case to balance out the two companies having troubles, Netflix and Cisco. Okay, so that's the uh, first half um, review of the first three cases we went over. I hope this wrap up just kind of um, a nice bookend to this work, and uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Take care.